person or on Zoom, we will be recording tonight's event. I'm so glad that we're here today in person. It kind of feels like a small miracle to me, and I'm, I'm really joyful to be here. On behalf of the Delta of Maryland chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's visiting scholar lecture. We'd like to thank the Office of Academic and Campus Life, our provost, Dr. Rosa Rivera Hainai, the Honors Program, President Julie Jaskin, Julia Jaskin, and her husband, David Cohoon, and the Departments of Biology, Communication and Cinema, English, and Philosophy for supporting this event. And if I was supposed to thank someone else, please forgive me. Phi Beta Kappa is the nation's oldest academic honor society. Its aims are to celebrate academic excellence, foster freedom of thought and expression, and to champion education in the liberal arts and sciences. One concrete way that Phi Beta Kappa achieves these goals is through the Visiting Scholar Program. Each year, distinguished scholars participating in the program visit colleges and universities with chapters of Phi Beta Kappa, becoming part of the academic life of these campuses during their two-day visits. They meet informally with students and faculty members, participate in classroom discussions and seminars, and give a public lecture open to the academic community and the general public. Tonight's visiting scholar is Dr. Rosemary Garland Thompson. Professor Emerita of English and Bioethics at Emory University. And she is also a senior advisor and fellow at the Hastings Institute, the Hastings Center, excuse me. Dr. Garland Thompson holds bachelor and master's degrees in English from the University of Nevada, Reno, a master's degree in bioethics from Emory University, and a PhD in English from Brandeis University. She is a disability justice and culture thought leader bioethicist, educator, and humanities scholar. Her, published, her publications include About Us, essays from the disability series of the New York Times, Staring, How We Look, and Extraordinary Bodies, Figuring Physical Disability in American Culture and Literature. She's published widely in the scholarly literature, appeared in a variety of news outlets, and has, had, and has led workshops and seminars sponsored by the United Nations High Commission on Human Rights, the US Department of State, the Smithsonian Institution, the Vatican, among others. Altogether, her work advances the field of critical disability studies and informs thought and action on disability access, inclusion, and identity. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Garland Thompson as she presents Building a World That Includes Diversity. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, thank you for all of you for coming uh, to this event and uh, for the opportunity for me to uh, share my work with this really wonderful community I've got to know in the last couple of days here at McDaniel College. Uh, I want to specifically thank the Phi Beta Kappa book, Phi Beta Kappa, Kappa, oh, I'm sorry, uh, National Society, um, as well as Dr. Mary, who has been the gracious and um, marvelously efficient uh, host uh, for my visit, and for everyone that I've had the opportunity to meet and work with here. So um, I'm going to begin by a, a few uh, kind of um, con moments of putting what I'm doing here in context. I have to say, this is the first professional event that I have participated in in person uh, since March of 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. And I am humbled and thrilled to be able to do this. I was not a person that was made to be locked up in any small room. Uh, the work that we do collectively in the knowledge economy, if you will, um, is best carried out in person. So it's very moving for me to be here tonight. Um, so thank you for that opportunity. I wanna say a couple of uh, words about accessibility. Um, 
I put on my dress up mask, uh, but I think um, we've discussed this, that it might be appropriate for me to um, do this during my presentation for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's easier to breathe. And the other one is that um, being able to read lips, uh, which is a skill that all people uh, develop um, in order to communicate effectively amongst us as human beings um, is something that's really quite important. And we don't have real-time captioning for this presentation, although the people on Zoom will benefit from uh, the transcription function of Zoom, which is essentially uh, real-time captioning. Uh, that's a function of that particular technology. So we consulted and people are feeling safe about that, I think, and um, I'm very happy to be able to, to do this. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm finding that uh, being out and about, I have what I call phantom mask syndrome, where after it comes off, I feel like I have it on still. Um, but in any case, uh, we'll do our best. Uh, I also wanted to say something about access in relation to my presentation. So what I've tried to do this evening is put together a PowerPoint presentation uh, that uh, helps me create the most accessible communication environment in multiple formats that I can offer. Uh, in other words, my presentation tonight will be in multiple forms. It will have a visual form, that is the PowerPoint, with images and words. It will have an auditory form, and that is my, um, my voice. And it will also have um, a, you know, uh, I guess, technological form for the people who are accessing uh, this presentation by Zoom. Sometimes when I give lectures, there are other forms of communication. If we have a sign language interpreter in the room, or if someone has requested uh, real-time captioning for the presentation, there will often be an alternative screen and the very entertaining captioner who kind of gets a lot of words wrong and people pay more attention to that than they do to me. So <laughs> um, in any case, I wanted to just kind of note these multiple forms of access. When we have our question and answer period afterward, we will also do access best practices. And that is we will ask people to come up and use a microphone. We want to use microphones all the time in our uh, work in order to present a robust uh, auditory environment that's available to all. So uh, just a few words about that. I should also say that in deference to other access needs, this is a long presentation. I talk a lot, I have a lot of images. Um, I will read the words on the slides. Again, that purpose of that is to give you two formats of communication. I won't always describe the images, a friend of mine who's a blind uh, professor says that PowerPoint is an access aid for the sighted, which I think is really interesting. So sighted people will have the benefit of seeing some of these images uh, that I won't describe, but I will describe at least um, provisionally some of the important images in this presentation. So that's my kind of access introduction and statement. Okay, what do we do now? What? 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 While we're working on the technology, let me say that it's been really thrilling 
to see how uh, accessible this campus actually is. Um, and it's physically uh, accessible as it must be, of course, because of the mandates, uh, the federal mandates that require certain kinds of access practices. But one of the things I've noticed is a really strong commitment to disability diversity and to intersectional diversity and a really strong community uh, that is supported by the administration and the faculty of this university. Uh, I'm sorry, I keep saying university. I need to say college, which is important. Um, and uh, I want to commend you all for um, for that achievement, which is um, it's it's um, commendable. Okay, so somehow oh, we're just going to have that thing on the side. Is that what's going to be? Yeah. Okay. Well. All right, so what I'm going to speak with you about tonight is um, what I call building a world that includes disability. And I am emphasizing here the word building as an active verb uh, because we are engaged together in the process of building, making a diverse world that welcomes a variety of different human variations that we think of as disabilities. And I wanna use intentionally the word includes here in my title to make a gesture to the initiatives that are robust here and in many places across um, educational circles and in corporations. And that is toward the institutionalization of uh, departments and structures that are called diversity, equity and inclusion, DEI, which I think is a very uh, felicitous development just over the last few years. Um, okay, so I also should say that this is long. I talk a lot. And if any of you need to leave, feel free to do so. That's why it's good to have the reception before instead of after. Okay. Okay, so the clicker doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, turn it on. There you go. Oh, that's fine. I can I can just use the space bar of this. No problem. No worries. I've got one in my bag, but it'll take a half an hour to get it set up. OK, this is how things go with technology, as we well know. OK, so I want to begin with uh, one of the main principles of the disability rights, the disability culture, and the disability studies movement in the United States and worldwide. And that is the concept that comes from uh, the historian Douglas Bainton, that disability is everywhere once you know how to look for it, once you know how to find it. And that's what I'm going to try to help us with tonight is finding and looking for disability. So I wanna begin with some definitions. What is disability? I have several definitions that are my own idiosyncratic definitions. They're a little bit thick, but um, I'll read them to you. So the human variations we think of as disabilities are part of the human condition that occur in every family, every life, and, and this is important for my presentation, are a theme in all art and culture. And I'm showing here a funerary statue. I won't call attention to these images uh, from Giza uh, from about uh, almost 3000 BC to show us a family of people who have a family member with a disability, someone who uh, is a person of small stature or a little person. Another definition, and I like this, it's a little bit poetic, um, uh, and that is disability is a record that is written on the body, on our bodies, of our encounters between our flesh and the world in which we live. And again, I'm showing some portraits of people with disabilities. Some of them are well-known, some of them are less well-known. I'll make this PowerPoint, by the way, accessible in the form of something like a PDF if other people would like to follow up on the images. 
and the information. Um, I have a caption for all of the images. I'm not going to go through it all, of course, but if anyone wants to review any of this information, I'm happy to have that available. The lived experiences of disability give people in communities opportunities for expression, for creativity, resourcefulness, relationships, and flourishing. It's a word I really love. It comes from the philosophy literature. So where do we find disability if it is everywhere? Once we know how to look for it, where do we find disability? And I want to suggest this evening that we find disability in literature, in dance, in art, and in design. These are the cultural representations of the human variations that we think of as disability. And I'll be talking about them more fully in the rest of my presentation. So disability, another assertion, it crosses all genre, media, time periods, aesthetic themes, and cultures, once we know how to look for it and once we know how to find it. What does finding disability do? Okay, so once we find it, what will that do in the world and in our lives and in our communities? So here are my assertions. Finding disability is an opportunity to explore, to define, redefine, and to make new stories. This is very important, the narrative aspect of disability, history and culture to make new stories about what it means to be human. Finding disability helps us understand how communities make and unmake the human variations that we think of as disabilities. So these human variations that we think of as disabilities, and that's an awkward term, but I use it to kind of invent language that calls attention to itself and that questions some of our assumptions about disability. So we make and unmake disability all the time. War makes disability or unmakes disability. Our technologies make disability and they unmake disability. So we have computers which help us to make full lives for people with disabilities, but those computers also, for any of us who have repetitive stress syndrome, cause disabilities. Uh, medicine, of course, creates disability every day, and it also unmakes disability. So we want to think about this as a dynamic process rather than as a static condition. When we find disability, it helps us to find the tradition the tradition of disability as an aesthetic and a narrative resource. And that's one of the things that I want us to think about. And I have an image in here of the most famous double amputee in all of Western art. And she <laughs> lives in Paris where we wish we all lived. And that's the um, Venus de Milo. Okay, I'm gonna start with literature and the arts and give you some examples of what I have been talking about about disability stories throughout history. So the founding narrative of Western civilization, arguably, of course, is the story of Oedipus the King, written by Sophocles. And that story is bookended by disability. Oedipus begins as a disabled infant. Oedipus means broken foot. And he is exposed by his parents, which launches the narrative. At the end, and I'm showing an image here uh, from 1896 of an actor playing Oedipus, tearing at his clothes after he has gouged his eyes out in these Greek plays are gross. Um, and he, of course, is making himself disabled at the end. Of, I mean, they wouldn't say disabled then, but we do now at the end of the play. So the, the, the story of Oedipus is bookended by disability. And so this influences the way we think about disability and people with disabilities. Um, we, of course, have the whole genre of monsters and freaks that uh, is extraordinarily generative and interesting for us. We have Caliban from The Tempest, a monster. We have Frankenstein, of course, the most famous, uh, you know, disabled, if you will, uh, character 
in perhaps all of English literature. And we have a lot of um, sort of uh, memoirs and historical uh, work that is done about people with disabilities. And this is an example of the play, The Elephant Man. Literature abounds with disability story. Disability is a great narrative prompt. We have Eva who had consumption in Uncle Tom's cabin. That's crucial to the storyline. Of course, Dickens and the sentimental authors uh, feature disabled characters all the time. This is an image of a Christmas carol and we have the very famous Tiny Tim, the most famous sort of cripple in all of uh, Western history and literature. Um, in terms of American literature, the uh, two most canonical novels uh, in American literature from the 19th and the 20th century, from the 19th century, Herman Melville's Moby Dick turns on a protagonist or a leading character who has a disability, Captain Ahab, the peg leg megalomaniac. Um, and then, of course, in The Sound and the Fury, William Faulkner's uh, 20th century novel, the main character is Benji Thompson, who is called, uh, and this is a reference to Shakespeare, an idiot, but we would call Benji Thompson now someone with a cognitive uh, disability or someone who is a neurodiverse person. I'm showing an image here of my uh, colleague and friend who is a poet, and he has quadriplegia, his name is Paul Guest. And I call him a mouth stick poet because when he uses a mouth stick, which is, I'm showing a picture of that, that is a stick that you put in your mouth that you use to scroll through. Uh, this is a prosthetic device, images um, on a, a telephone or an iPad. And when he reads his poetry, he uses the mouth stick to do this. And it really influences the cadence and the pronunciation of his poetry. So it's a very interesting new narrative form that comes from disability experience. I'm going to show some uh, images of people from popular culture. This is the disabled comedian Maison Zaid, uh, pictured in a TED talk uh, from 2013. She likes to talk about herself not as a stand-up comedian, but as a sit-down comedian. She identifies as somebody with cerebral palsy, and she makes a lot out of her unusual speech and her unusual bodily movements and her kind of performance um, as a comedian. It's, it's really quite engaging. Um, there are many television programs and performances uh, that involve people with disabilities. I'm just gonna scroll through these rather quickly. Push Girls is a television show that actually has people with disabilities in it. I don't even know if it's still on now. I'm not very up to date about television series, but um, I do want to mention, and this is really important, um, the actor Peter Dinklage, who is really one of our most distinguished actors. He was in an early film called The Station Agent. If you've had an opportunity to see that, it's a wonderful film. Those of you who are working in cinema studies uh, might want to do some work on um, disability in film. Um, I can say a little bit more about that later. But um, this is a picture of him from The Game of Thrones which I've watched only a couple of times and he's quite well known on this, but it's also a picture of him as the cover guy uh, on Esquire and Maureen Dowd of the Washington uh, Post did a great interview with him. And um, she said he was America's first dwarf heartthrob. And I thought, that's right. Um, this is a very short film. It's an award-winning film. Somebody should, Put this in your deaf culture uh, curriculum. It's a film called Can You Read My Lips? It's literally about four minutes long. It's done uh, not by, but it's about uh, the disability uh, scholar who now is at the Harvard Society for Fellows, Rachel Kolb, who is a uh, bilingual, I mean, uh, uh, ASL sign uh, language user, and who was the first ASL sign language using deaf road scholar. So it's a great little film about lip reading. So dance and gestural narrative. There's a lot going on in what we call disability dance. Here's an example of a dance company with three dancers. 
And amongst the three dancers, because one of the dancers is an amputee, we have five legs. And so they call the troupe Five Foot Feet, F-E-A-T, which is, a, of course, a play on F-E-E-T. It's very clever. And they do great dance. Um, this is an image of Leroy F. Moore, who is a poet and the creator of a dance form that he calls Crip Hop. And it is obviously hip hop performance uh, by people with disabilities. Uh, Leroy is someone who identifies as a person with cerebral palsy. So he utilizes the really interesting dance movements uh, and performance movements that are characteristic of people often with cerebral palsy in his performances. Uh, this is um, Bill Shannon, the uh, great dancer who again uses disability prosthetics, in this case, his crutches, which he's fashioned very intentionally with little rockers on the bottom so that he has developed an entire movement vocabulary around break dancing that is again, characteristic of his embodiment and his identity as a person with a disability. And he goes by the um, that stage name, if you will, Crutch Man, which I think is great. Um, this is an image of Claire Cunningham, who's a UK dancer who incorporates um, prosthetic devices or what we call disability equipment into the choreographies and the performances of dance. Um, it has been said that the wheelchair and the crutch are the most interesting um, additions to contemporary dance since the invention of the toe shoe, uh, which I think is an interesting uh, kind of observation. And here she's using these crutches in a very uh, idiosyncratic and creative way. She has the, the crutch, which is designed to be on her forearms, on her forearms, but she also has one around her neck and one around her ankle. Um, this is um, uh, two images, um, and I really love this dance stuff, which is why I'm spending a lot of time on it. These are two dancers, David Toole on the left, who just recently died, I'm sorry to say, he's an English dancer, and Homer Avila, who died a number of years ago, and they are dancers with unusual configurations of limbs. So Homer Avila is a one-legged dancer, he had uh, a fairly well-established career as a two-legged dancer and um, uh, had one leg amputated. And um, his career took off because this new form of embodiment gave him and the people who choreographed for him new opportunities, again, to develop movement vocabularies, a lot of floor work, you might well imagine, that were very distinctive and interesting. Um, David Toole is a legless dancer, and I think this concept is really provocative. I'm showing him here in a costume designed for him by Alexandra McQueen, the uh, British costume designer, clothes designer, that was designed specifically, it's a skirt that's kind of a fan, for a dancer who dances on hands and arms rather than dancing on legs. And of course, what's really provocative about this, uh, if you will, evolution of the development of contemporary dance is that it gives us the opportunity to completely redefine what it means to dance since legs have been imagined traditionally as essential properties of dance. Uh, this is an image of Alice Shepard and Laurel Lawson from um, the dance company Kinetic Light in a 2017 performance um, called Descent. These are premier wheelchair dancers um, who um, have developed, again, a dance vocabulary of extreme virtuosity around their uh, use of uh, wheelchairs in their dancing. And also in this particular performance of Descent, uh, there was a ramp that was built. And so they were using the ramp as, again, part of the setting uh, for dance, which is very unusual because of course a dance floor is always imagined as 
um, completely parallel, completely horizontal, but a ramp again opened up all sorts of amazing new opportunities for choreographic expression and movement. You can find um, videos of these performances from Kinetic Light, which are very, um, are really quite astonishing. Um, this is one of my things. So um, you may know that the 200th anniversary of Frankenstein was a couple of years ago. And on the occasion, uh, Liam Scarlett uh, from the uh, London Royal Opera House did an opera of Frankenstein. And I spent quite a bit of time with this. I saw it a couple of times. And um, I thought it was really interesting to see how the performance of other bodiedness, if you will, was translated from a narrative textual account where we don't have a lot of details about what the creature, if you've ever read Frankenstein, actually looks like. What we read about the creature from Mary Shelley is that it scares the wits out of everybody and it's big. But when you do a translation of a narrative and textual work into a dance performance, you have to think differently about representation. And I thought they did an extraordinarily interesting job of choreographing the otherness, if you will, of the creature in this, and in my view, very, very moving um, opera. So you can get this on a DVD and put it in your disability and music classes. This is a wonderful pas de deux. I wrote a long piece about this, if anybody's interested, a wonderful pas de deux between Victor and uh, the creature, uh, which is at the, um, at the uh, climax of the, of the uh, of the novel, but also, well, they didn't have a pas de deux in the novel, but certainly in the ballet, uh, pas de deux were used in really interesting and creative ways here. Uh, so art and design. Um, we find disability in several ways in art and design, and I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about this. We find disability, number one, as a subject of art. So I'm showing here, um, a painting by Peter Bruegel, the elder, uh, called The Cripples from 1568. And it shows beggars and, of course, the employment history of people with disabilities throughout almost all of human history has been begging. Um, and they are beggars out and about with their homemade prosthetics in the public world. Um, we also have here a base from 480 to 470 BCE of a little person from Greek culture. Um, this is one of the most famous uh, protest paintings in um, uh, English uh, Western art. And that is John Singer Sargent's uh, 1918 protest, if you will, anti-war painting called Gassed. And it shows a number of uh, wounded uh, soldiers who have been gassed who are participating in a practice that's very common in blind communities, and that is um, leading one another. Of course, this can be understood as a kind of functional blind leading the blind by putting one's hand on the shoulder of the person ahead. And there's some really also interesting things that have been done in this respect. I just wanted to show this. Um, this is uh, a painting by Jacob Lawrence, the African-American uh, painter from 1938 called Blind Beggars. And it shows blind beggars all dressed up going down the street in Harlem with a bunch of children around them. And I read this as a very gala scene of uh, disability out and about in the world in public. We find disability shaping art. In other words, an artist with the human variations that we think of as disabilities will relate to and produce art differently because of the body that produces, or the mind that produces that art. So there's the imprint of disability on art that is produced by artists 
with disabilities. And of course, perhaps the most well-known of these figures right now in the world is the artist Frida Kahlo, who had significant disabilities and incorporated those disabilities and her own self-representations, but also her disability shaped the art itself and the life of the artist who produced that art. Um, Van Gogh, of course, Vincent Van Gogh, perhaps one of the most famous disabled uh, neurodiverse, as we would say now, I think, uh, artist painted a self-portrait here of himself uh, with a bandaged ear after he had self-mutilated. Um, this is an interesting and less recognizable example of the imprint of the artist's body uh, on the artwork. And this is a uh, picture of late work of Claude Monet. The late work of many artists is imprinted by disability. Chuck Close is an interesting one to take a look at if you are interested in art history. He just died as well. The American uh, photorealist, as they call him, Chuck Close. But as Monet aged, he, like everyone, became uh, more and more blind. And so what he saw was what he painted in his late works, and it was fuzzy things. And they were interpreted not as reduced in their aesthetic value, but rather they were interpreted now, of course, as being an aesthetic evolution rather than a de devolution. But in fact, it was that he was able to see the world differently and to paint the world differently as his eyesight decreased in his later years. Um, this is a sculpture by the sculptor Nancy Freed. It's one of a whole genre of representations, both photographic and artistic, um, of one-breasted women. Uh, and this was uh, part of the breast cancer awareness initiative that began in the 1970s that were really, uh, in many cases, protests against um, unequitable funding for breast cancer research. And so there is a whole, a whole host of representations of these sort of Amazonian one-breasted women, which is what you're seeing here as a self-portrait. We find disability also as a concept in art. This is a little bit harder to understand or to grasp. Um, I'm showing you here an example of Christine Sun Kim, who is a sound artist. And what's interesting about Christine Sun Kim and her work is that she is a deaf sound artist. And what she explores in her work is sound itself, and how sound makes meaning and how sound occurs and is an element of her own life and work as an artist. So what she's doing is contradicting the assumption that deaf people don't have any relationship with sound. And she's suggesting that deaf people have a tremendously important relationship with sound, but it's a very interesting uh, relationship that hearing people do not always have. So if you have an opportunity to look at any of her work, it's really quite remarkable. And again, in your deaf culture and deaf studies program, it might be uh, good to think about her. She's got a lot of, of course, uh, you know, videos that you can access quite easily. Um, this is a, uh, a portrait. Um, it's a rip, if you will, on uh, Manet's Olympia. It's done by the artist, uh, Catherine Sherwood who is a uh, person with a disability who had a stroke in the middle of her artistic career and became paralyzed so that she needed to start using her left hand to do work when she had used her right hand. And it created an opportunity for a whole lot of uh, very interesting explorations. And one of the things that she did is to incorporate uh, images, um, uh, uh, sonographic images of her brain, x-rays of her brain, in all of her paintings since she became a disabled artist. This is uh, a work by Jesse Park, who is a self-identified autistic artist. 
It's called the structure of flame. Uh, there is quite a bit of uh, cultural production from uh, the artistic community, people with autism here. This is an example. Um, I wanted to recruit uh, Picasso, who of course is not necessarily understood as a disabled artist, nor is Picasso understood as having disability as a concept or a subject of art. But if you actually consider this woman in the blue hat from 1939, it can be understood perhaps as a representation of someone who we might think of, I call this um, having an unusual face or what we think of as facial, um, I don't like this term very well, facial deformity or facial uh, disfiguration. Uh, but surrealism is one of the areas where we find some very interesting representation of what we might think of as the possibilities uh, of disability representation. Uh, this is the artist Judith Scott, whoops, um, who, uh, I'm gonna go back to this in a minute, but I wanted you to uh, be able to have the caption here. Uh, Judith Scott is a sculptor artist who, uh, uh, she's passed away now, she was deaf, uh, and she uh, was nonverbal, non speaking, um, and she had Down syndrome. And she began in some sheltered kind of arts and crafts workshop at some place to start wrapping, uh, to start working with fibers. And she has become one of the most important American, sometimes called outsider artists. Um, and this is one of her sculptures that uh, when, in which she wraps a chair and a uh, bicycle or perhaps a wheelchair uh, uh, wheel uh, with a variety of different fibers and fabrics. And this is an image of Judith Scott, uh, which is a little bit controversial, but uh, she's hugging one of her sculptures. Judith Scott never said anything to anybody, ever commented in any way about the art that she produced. She simply produced art. I wanna talk here, hmm, my E fell off, um, about accessible and inclusive design as an extraordinarily productive opportunity. Um, after the mandates, federal mandates, that the world would be made accessible uh, to people with disabilities, architects and designers went to work to transform the built and designed world that we live in and share together here. And I wanted to show you a lot of these images. And I wanted to have, I usually don't have this much text, but I wanted to give another definition of disability, or really it's more a definition of who are people with disabilities, who are the disabled. And I wanted to put it in here because this polit socio-political phenomenon created people with disabilities as a community, the laws that came from the disability rights movement and created the opportunity for rebuilding the world and redesigning the world that I'm gonna share with you a little bit. So here's something I just worked up. It's my assertion here. Disabled people are a politically created group of qualified individuals you know from SAS here that you have to qualify to be disabled. Qualified individuals protected by disability rights legislation, such as the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 and 2008, against discrimination and accorded the right to request reasonable accommodations. This constituted a community of people that didn't really exist before in the same way. So it's a really important part of the history of civil and human rights in the United States and worldwide. And because of this constituting, this gathering and defining of a community, we are all the beneficiaries of a more accessible world for all of us to use together. And that's what I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about access. So I began by saying disability is everywhere. I want you to know how to look for it. And I want to riff on that and say access is everywhere once you know how to look for it. And I'll give you some examples here of how we might look for access. 
So obviously the most important symbol of access in a post ADA or actually post disability rights movement is the wheelchair stick figure uh, that was designed in 1968. But I wanted to show you a newer uh, updated, if you will, version of that guidepost for accessible paths that is designed by Sarah Hendren, who is an engineering professor um, in the Boston area. And that is a more dynamic um, uh, figure of disability that really reflects the way disability technology has developed so that we don't imagine wheelchair users as being pushed around by other people anymore. We imagine wheelchair users as being powered through their own agency in some way, either in power wheelchairs or what we call manual wheelchairs. So this controversial, of course, new version of disability access um, has now been adopted quite widely. The state of New York um, adopted this sign. So this is part of the iconography of disability access um, that's actually really important. Um, I love this uh, because many of you may know that federal, uh, federal uh, Frederick uh, Delano Roosevelt, FDR, uh, our president uh, for a, a long time during the 1920s and 30s, our leader during most of World War II, the architect of the New Deal, was a person with what we would now call post-polio syndrome. So FDR used a wheelchair every day of his life, but he did not use a wheelchair in public. And this is a difference between then and now. Part of the reason he didn't use a wheelchair in public is that there weren't accessible paths for him to use his wheelchair himself. He would have had to be pushed or be in a very confined environment. I mean, there are many reasons why he didn't do that. But part of the mythologies of FDR is nobody knew he had a disability because he was always hiding it. But in fact, everyone knew he had a disability. He just did not display it in the way that we are now comfortable displaying, if you will, or carrying our disabilities uh, as we go about uh, uh, our lives. And the testimony to this is that he got um, presents from heads of state and they were canes for him to use. And this is a collection at Warm Springs where there's a, an FDR memorial. That's where he started a rehabilitation center, a very important rehabilitation center in the first part of the 20th century. And this is his collection of canes that were given to him as gifts by uh, heads of state. Um, if you have the opportunity to go uh, to the FDR Memorial in Washington, DC, that's really would be a great field trip for your uh, disability culture uh, folks. Uh, these are uh, a pair of wonderful shoes designed by my friend, uh, the designer Sandy Yi, who designs clothes for herself and other people with disabilities. And these particular shoes fit the very unusual shape of her feet by um, putting a horn in between her um, unusually shaped toes. Uh, this is an example uh, from the Alternative Limb Project of a new kind of prosthetic that is designed to be looked at. It is designed to be aestheticized. It is designed to call attention to itself. It's designed to show off. This is an example of a floral design on a prosthetic leg. But if you're interested in this sort of thing, prosthetic design, go to the website for the Alternative Limb Project. It's out of the UK. And you will see some fabulous, often jewel-encrusted uh, prosthetics that have been designed uh, by this, um, by this uh, project that are really very, very interesting. Uh, because, of course, the purpose of prosthetics was to be hidden in the past. The prosthetics, the purpose of prosthetics now is often to display them. And, of course, that's possible now because people using prosthetics are out and about in the world and have access to economic resources that make it possible for them to have prosthetic devices that they 
present as fashion statements. And of course, the leading, the iconic prosthetic device that has evolved into a fashion statement is what we all have on our faces at this point, and that is our fashion glasses, which are really prosthetic devices, of course. Um, this is an Eames-inspired prosthetic leg that matches the Eames, famous Eames chair. I think it's just a wonderful thing. And this guy, you know, really great looking guy has got a suit on with short pants so that his Eames-inspired prosthetic leg will be very visible in his self-presentation. Uh, this is the very well-known engineer, Hugh Hare at MIT, who has developed astonishing prosthetic legs, including the um, cheetah leg, which is uh, used by a lot of uh, um, Paralympians. It's, I don't have a picture of it, but it's the leg that's shaped like a giant S that's very elegant that many, uh, as I said, runners uh, use to run on. And this is Hugh Hare with his fancy legs. Um, this is uh, my colleague uh, and friend, Kathy D. Woods, who is a, uh, uh, has a line of um, bespoke clothes that are designed, well, I guess they're not just bespoke, they're a line of clothes designed for small adults. So small people have a great deal of difficulty getting professional clothes because really the only thing that fits them are children's clothes. So she was really, she's a person of small stature or a little person herself. She's really um, filling a market need by designing these professional clothes for uh, people with disabilities, in particular for small people. Um, this is a prosthetic leg uh, that can be made with a 3D printer by the people who are the users of the prosthetic leg. There's a lot of, of, of these design and prosthetic uh, innovations that are really quite remarkable. Um, this is what's called a squeeze chair, which is available for people uh, with neurodiversity who require or prefer certain kinds of pressures. Uh, Temple Grandin, of course, is the most famous um, a uh, person with autism in the country now, and she makes a big deal of how she squeezes herself. Well, this is a squeeze chair that is designed to provide the same kind of, I don't know, I guess accommodation uh, as Temple Grandin, but it's also quite lovely. Um, this is, uh, people are fascinated by this. It's a tactile watch for anybody, but it's a tactile watch for blind people. In other words, it's a watch that you can tell time by touching rather than looking at. Um, this is me using my important uh, accessible technology. Uh, I do not engage with a keyboard. I don't type. Um, and so this is a significant limitation in our world. And the development of built-in rather than bolted on dictation technology has, um, and portable devices like iPads and um, I guess we should say tablets and smartphones now, um, have changed the way I am able to do my work and have made the work, uh, the work world much more accessible uh, to me. So um, that was an important transformation. And it was also important that these technologies are now built in, which means that they are accessible to anyone to use them for any reason. So they are not special technologies for people with disabilities. They're universally accessible to all of us. The screen readers or the talk to text as well as the text to talk technologies that we have on our phones, as well as a bunch of other access features on phones. If you just you know how to go in and look at them, you can turn them on and off at will without having to pay a bunch of money for them. Um, these technologies, uh, video technologies, have again transformed on a phone the way deaf people uh, communicate with one another. Now that they are able to communicate by a sign in a video environment, basically so easy uh, on a phone, it's really changed um, deaf communication and deaf culture significantly. I'm showing a picture of somebody signing on the phone. Of course, 
wheelchair or wheeled mobility technology has changed tremendously since it has moved from medical technologies or medical prosthetic devices to the various forms of wheel technologies that are um, you know, out and about in the world. Anyone who's ever had to navigate a really big airport, regardless of your disability status, those available wheelchairs are extremely important and they're a great uh, universal access technology for, for all of us. Um, this is one of my favorite pieces of accessible technology. It's these, I call them SUV strollers. <laughs> and so uh, to give you a little bit of a history of uh, accessible transportation, the ADA did not specifically identify accessible transportation um, as one of its mandates. So there needed to be a lot of work to move municipalities to develop accessible transportation systems. And so before we had the smooth interface between platform and car, before we had the platforms on buses or kneeling buses or buses that, that have the platforms that allow people on wheel devices access to public transportation, people who were charged with the care of other human beings that were not ambulatory were pretty much stuck in the home. And that of course is largely families and women. But when that took place, which was largely to accommodate wheelchair users. Often, uh, there was a big movement, ADAPT, uh, that came from Vietnam vets, because every war has uh, produces a particular demographic of people with disabilities, and the Vietnam War produced a demographic of people who had spinal cord injuries, because in previous wars, people with spinal cord, spinal cord injuries would not have survived. And also, of course, the, the kind of warfare that was practiced in the Vietnam War um, created spinal cord injuries, particularly in the way that World War II created blind people with the use of gassing. And so these guys were out there, they were upset. They were chaining themselves to buses. They were really responsible for transforming transportation into um, accessible transportation so that they could use public transportation because there was a whole generation of them. But of course, one of the great beneficiaries is all of us because we have now these kinds of strollers which allows people to bring multiple um, people, children onto public transportation, get out of the house, if you will. Um, and of also, of course, the major benefit for all of us has been the invention of rolling suitcases and the increasing wheel mobility that's possible, like you can take your skateboards and your bicycles on public transportation now in a way that you couldn't before at all. So there is an environmental feature to this, of course. Um, anyway, so I'm showing here uh, a picture of this recognizable platform that many of us don't even think about anymore with these raised domes which allow people who are navigating with canes to know when they're coming to an edge. That's a really important thing to know. And also for uh, people who have, need wheeled access to know when they're coming to an edge, an edge that is accessible. Um, again, I'm showing here a picture of somebody with these dual huge strollers um, on a subway car. Um, I just love this. This is in the Library of Congress, which is one of the most sacred spaces in our country. And it is, I've never seen anything like this. It's an emergency access wheel vehicle to go up and down the stairs in an emergency. And it struck me as just such an innovative device. It's got three wheels together that work as a wheel within a wheel. I don't know how it was what it is, but it is a design that is extraordinarily innovative that has come as a result of the um, mandates to make the world accessible for people with disabilities. 
Um, this is a picture of portable ramps that serve to make uh, houses that are inaccessible, visitable, um, which is an important real estate notion now, a visitable house is a house that doesn't comply completely to ADA codes, but that it complies enough that someone with a disability can visit, like your grandmother, or if you don't imagine yourself as a person with a disability, but you suddenly find yourself on crutches, um, you may want to live in a house that is understood as visitable. Um, and so that's a really important development in disability design and basically real estate and building. Because in 1968, to put a ramp on a beautiful building was thought to, and did, uh, reduce its value. Now to have an accessible building increases its value. I love this. It never occurred to me when I went to um, the East and I saw these fancy toilets. If any, any of you have ever visited somewhere where they have these uh, toilets that have fans and bidets, they're, they're actually bidets. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is really over the top here. And then I realized a little bit later that they are, they may be over the top, but they are also accessible toilets that allow people with quadriplegia or other kinds of uh, mobility impairments to toilet without assistance. And that's really an important access feature. Um, and sometimes you will see toilets like this in public spaces as access features. Not very often because they're really expensive and they're also kind of hard to use, but um, and they're very important and interesting um, devices that um, are particularly effective in single use restrooms uh, now, which are what we think of as the disabled uh, and single use and single sex uh, bathrooms. Uh, again, the transformation of public toileting that the ADA has wrought has created a whole new way of using um, uh, uh, space for public sanitation. Um, and we have come to recognize uh, the sign of the single use restroom uh, as the accessible restroom. And uh, I thought this was wonderful because it's braille as well. Um, here's an example, of course, of the classic piece of disability design, and that is the ramp, uh, which has been incorporated in aesthetically gorgeous ways into buildings all across the world, but certainly all across the United States, as architects and designers have recognized the possibilities, the aesthetic possibilities of these mandates to make the world, to build the world that is inclusive for people with disabilities. So I'm showing an image here of the Frank Lloyd Wright building at the Guggenheim Museum, which had a ramp in it, but it was not designed in any way as an access ramp, but it was a design feature central, if you've ever been there, to the building. And I'm showing also here one of the most beautiful and, and well-known ramps um, in the United States, and it's at the Ed Roberts uh, campus in Berkeley, and it's this red helical, again, ramp that is not attached on the edge of the building, or let alone strapped onto the front of the building and made out of aluminum. It is at the center of their very building, and it is part of the, um, of the design elegance of the building itself. So I wanted to end with um, a little sense of lesson here in what can an aesthetics, I mean, ethics uh, of disability inclusion do? And I wanted to specifically use the term ethics uh, of disability inclusion to introduce the concept of ethics and human and civil rights into the conversation about building an inclusive world and building an accessible environment. So I have some suggestions about this. So when you create an accessible environment, both a built environment and an attitudinal environment 
an aesthetic environment, if you will, a knowledge environment, which of course you are charged with here at a college to build an accessible knowledge environment. It creates inclusion and diversity. By the very fact of creating access, you make the paths and you build the world that is then inclusive and diverse. So you have to start with access in order to achieve the inclusion and diversity that we're after. So you don't want to get the cart and the horse wrong. Accessible design and the world that is built through accessible design has, and this is really important, it is shared who we, it has changed who we share our world with. 40 years ago, if you got on a bus to get to work, you would never encounter a person who's a wheelchair user on that bus. If you went to work, it's very unlikely that you would have a coworker who is a person with a disability, particularly, let's say, a wheelchair user, people with canonical disabilities, a blind coworker, a deaf coworker. But now we share our world with many much more diverse forms of embodiment, human embodiment, than we ever would have in a pre-disability rights movement. So this is what, how diversity is literally accomplished. All kinds of diversity, not just disability diversity, but that's what I'm focusing on here. So what does an accessible world that we can build together make? What does it do? I want to suggest that um, it will strengthen support for disability culture, presence, and awareness across all civic institutions. So this is both a description of what an accessible built environment can do and an inclusive community can do, but it's also a recommendation for what can be done to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion especially in relation to disability, but in general. Also, a mandate for a more inclusive environment, a more just environment, would develop practices that implement disability, inclusion, diversity, and justice. And the, the emphasis here is on the word practice, to think about what kinds of practices ways of doing our work and living our lives practices might help create and build a shared accessible environment to think about those. We do them every day, sometimes without even understanding that we're doing them, but to think about them consciously. To build inclusive environments that support all human embodied flourishing. In other words, shape the environment to fit humans rather than shaping humans to fit the environment. This is really an important principle of disability world building, and I might add medical practice. We would want to collectively promote the development of bioethical, cultural, technological, and legal supports for people living with disabilities as we are. In other words, don't change us, change the environment. And this is how you do it. You develop these tools, if you will, intentionally and collectively. And what will this do? What will this world that I'm talking about building together that we're all doing already, it will, I suggest, change attitudes, it will increase access, it will build community, and it will cultivate leadership. And those are really important diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. And I'm showing here, um, in conclusion, one of my favorite pictures, and this comes from the celebration at the White House um, in 2015 of the 25th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I talked about this 
a little bit in one of the classes that I was invited to come to today. And this is a picture of President Barack Obama, who um, was hosting, of course, this celebration at the White House. And um, in choreographing the whole ceremony, I had the opportunity to give a little bit of advice to the people who were uh, putting this ceremony together. And they said, who are we gonna get to introduce the president? Who are we gonna get to introduce the president? And I said, I know my friend, Haben Girna, who is the first, get this, deaf blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. So I know, who, who would have thought, right? So Haben is a first generation uh, American from an Eritrean immigrant family. And she's the first deafblind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. She's just a really good student. And um, <coughs> when she introduced Barack Obama, and later in the, at the reception for this, I'm telling you, swanky event uh, in the White House, she was using her technology, communication technology, which is Baroque in its complexity and impressiveness. She's got a dog, she's got a microphone, she's got a braille type thing. I mean, it's, it's quite a performance of access to see Haben work. And Barack Obama had never seen anything like this before. You could just see it on his face. It's like, I never imagined somebody like you in the world, Papagira, and here you are, and somebody got you to introduce me at this event. And it was really something. And this photograph was taken <clears throat> after the event, uh, after she had, Haben had introduced uh, Barack Obama, but it's really a wonderful photograph uh, because they're here together and they're actually holding hands in a way that would suggest, of course, this wasn't happening, uh, tactile sign language, which um, is something that um, deafblind people, Haben uses it a little bit, she uses everything, uh, deafblind people actually use. And of course, that's not going on, but I thought it was a very moving picture to see these two people who actually look a little bit alike. Um, uh, and with Joe Biden in the background thinking, huh, uh, about um, what's going to happen next in the world. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen next in the world. But Joe Biden is very much an advocate for uh, disability access and for people with disabilities because he grew up stuttering, which is a communication disability that is um, very stigmatizing. Um, and, and so, as you know, perhaps if you've participated in and watched um, his inauguration, he brought this um, uh, poet, Amanda Gordon, uh, who did this amazing poem and, you know, announced herself as a fellow stutterer with Joe Biden. And that's, you know, how they found her. So there was, there's a lot of leadership um, in, as there always has been in politics um, around disability access from both sides of the aisle. The ADA was uh, a piece of bipartisan legislation that was brought forward by uh, politicians and uh, government workers um, on all levels, uh, from the Kennedy family to Bob Dole, um, who um, uh, to uh, uh, Harkin, who had experience with uh, people with disabilities or had loved ones, friends, and family members with disabilities. Um, but that was a, a time that's quite different from now in the sense that we all are part of uh, the family of uh, people with disabilities. So thank you. We have a choreography of questions and I think some time left. Mary, thank you, Dr. Mary. Um, and what we're going to do, as I mentioned, is uh, in order to create an accessible, I mean, a robust auditory environment, we're going to ask people with questions to come up and, and to uh, line up and use the microphone and um, say who you are. 
and we'll have a conversation. I don't know how long we have that you can uh, I need to moderate on. this, if you will. Or comments. Well, this is the downside of not having the reception after. <laughs> what you really should do is have a reception before yeah. and then. I am happy to speak with anybody who wants to for a little while afterward if people have questions. Sometimes after a long presentation late at night and a lovely reception, people are a little stunned. Um, and uh, that would make a lot of sense. How shall we move forward? I think we'll just take you up on that offer that if anyone would like to stick around and talk with our speaker, we'll be here for a little while. And otherwise, thank you so much for coming and sharing your site with us. And we'll remax here. I really welcome the opportunity to grab this I said this. I'm still going to go with the article that I'm going to be able to do this piece of paper.